Okay. All right. Uh, let's start. Um, so we have a lot of things to cover. So um, I'm uh, right into it. Um, so today we're going to talk about CAD models. And if we have time, then we're going to do some skater exercise of uh, course matching model. But um, since the problem set two doesn't have any course matching model in it, so I'm just going to, uh, um, I'll cover that part if it's time allows. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, let's start. Okay. Um, so, uh, what is the motivation of path models? This is basically we're trying to achieve conditional ignorability okay? by adjusting some variables. And uh, based on this series of assumptions, assumptions about how uh, the data are getting. Right? So, we're trying to infer causation from association and its estimation. So to clarify what I mean, um, how society really works. Is for example, women are more likely to quote unquote women's jobs or pre uh, jobs that are occupied by, uh, predominantly occupied by women, and that affects wage. I'll explain what I mean in a minute, but um, my point here our postulation of DGT can be wrong in that sense. It can be different from how society really works. So, for example, we are assuming that there is direct effect from women on wage and indirect effect of uh, women on wage <coughs> through women being uh, women's jobs. And then they all have linear relationships with each other. All of the variables have linear relationships with each other. That is an assumption, right? So even though society, uh, this is not, this may not be how society really works, but we are making a series of, of assumptions that uh, that actually um, the GDP, uh, the actual uh, assumptions about how society really works. So this part uh, is different from estimation or estimation results. Okay. Women, wage, women's jobs, and women. Okay. So in the estimation results, Stata, so so to speak, it's it's what Stata tells you, right? Stata doesn't tell you what is the direction here, right? What is the relationship between women and wage? There is no direction by Stata. Okay. And then to estimate this path, to estimate this path. You should be adjusting for this variable or control for this variable. This variable should be conditioned to estimate this path. And to estimate this path, this path, women's jobs from wage, now 
this variable has to be conditioned. Does that make sense? So I'll, if that doesn't make sense at this point, that is fine. Um, because I'm, I will uh, talk about, I'll discuss what I mean by controlling in a minute, especially in path models. But uh, my point here is that you should be thinking about your postulation of DGP is not necessarily the same as how society really works. And this is different from actual estimation. So, to be more specific, here, the second part is in the world of identification. Can you identify the causal relationships from, say, women to wage? That is the question. But estimation is about um, how can we um, estimate this causal path better? Is it um, so? How can you condition on this variable better? Are you going to just like uh, put it in the regression model as control variables, or are you going to match on this variables? It's better. Uh, the estimation is this issue is basically about how to um, uh, estimate these variables, uh, how, sorry, how do you estimate these paths with different estimation strategies, such as matching or, or regression and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Any questions about that or? Nope. All right. So here in the identification world, you don't think about regression at all. This is not regression world, okay? In the estimation part, now the uh, regression comes into play. Okay? So you should really definitely think, uh, differentiate these two situations to think about uh, what questions um, you should think about in the specific stage of your research. Any questions? Am I making any sense or vague or no? Is it too vague so far or no? Oh yeah? Is it vague? Oh. It's just fine. It's just fine. Oh what? No, I just knew it. It's, 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 oh it's, it's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um so uh let's uh before delving into all of the uh Path models. And let's clarify the terminologies first. Um, so we covered DAGs or path models, right? The, uh, the DAGs is uh, short for directed acyclic health graphs. Okay, so it's a it's a strategy to um, really um, elaborate the relationships between their So to add a strategy to infer causation from association and estimation. It's a, a graphical strategy of that. Okay. See what I'm we're going there? That's the direction of that. That's the point of that. So people say, um, this is a little bit of side note. So people say uh, causation is not, uh, correlation is not necessary causation. But then the question is, how can you infer causation from association? That's more useful question, right? So um, yes, correlation is not causation. But then, if your question is causation, then you should be able to have more abilities or or abilities to infer causation from association. Right? That's more useful question. So that 
is a, is a strategy, graphical strategy to achieve that motivation. Good? Yeah. And then path models, it's a specific type of DAX where all the variables are assumed to be linear in linear relationships. DAX don't have any uh, parametric assumptions in the sense that it does not assume linear relationships. But path models assumes that uh, all the variables are in linear relationships. And uh, uh, you might have come across this term structural equation models. Structural equation models is the same term as causal equation models. Uh, structural equation models is basically the equation format of that or path model. So uh, structure equation models reflect what are the relationships among variables uh, in the form of equations, right? So in the simplest way possible, structure equation models are the equation or mathematical versions of that. Good. Any questions so far? All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, I think we have covered nodes, arrows, and missing arrows in the lecture, which is pretty straightforward. Um, but um, what, I, what I would mention is missing arrows is the exclusion of causal relationships. Okay. For example, if you exclude or this causal relationship, there is missing arrows, right? So you're thinking that there's no relationship, direct, at least direct relationship between women and wage. Okay. So these exclusions are criti critical in the identification of causal relationships. Because if you just put, put every variable out there and then just let them have relationship with each other, like for every possible relationship. Then uh, the model will not be uh, will be fitting all of the data, right? But then it is not necessarily have to give us uh, because it does not give us uh, give us a clear picture of uh, what is important in our relationship. What is really the important mechanism? in um, understanding how society really works, right? So you have uh, to be really, to have, um, you want to be really balanced between how um, more detailed description of society, but, and uh, more parsimonious uh, description of the society, which is a real life struggle as a researcher, but yeah. Any questions? And path coefficients, such as B, C, is a measure of strength of association between two variables in path models. Okay. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then structure or causal equations, as I mentioned earlier, it's a equation version of DAGs. It's, an, uh, it's a mathematical form of describing the relationships between variables. Any questions so far? Or... Um, so, and then uh, there is idiosyncratic error terms and correlated error terms. So, for example, let's look at education and wage relationship. Okay. An idiosyncratic error term means that 
Um, it's just noise or something that is not systematically related to any beer, any other beer. Okay. Just education is the sole uh, predictor of wage, and then everything else is not really related to uh, the residual is not really related to any beer. Okay. Does, does that make sense? So far, okay. It's basically, it's just a random. Yeah, random error. noise. Right. Yeah. But then this might be uh, too unrealistic, right? It might be um, related to other unobserved variables, such as unobserved variables can be, for example. If you subscribe to that um, <coughs> literature, <coughs> IQ would be one variable, um, or inherent in intelligence would be a, an unobserved variable, right? In that sense, this is correlated uh, error term. Good. It is also noted as this. Because we don't know you unobserved variables, we are noting this as something is related, but we don't know what's, uh, what's the relationship. Okay. Or, This is the same thing. So all of the no, no, uh, uh, graphical notations are equivalent to each other. Good. Any questions so far? No questions? All right. So um, let's talk about uh, pets in pet models. So pet ma uh, pets can be uh, divided into causal effects and non-causal effects for pets. Um, so um, so causal effects can be divided um, by, uh, so total causal effects can be divided to, into direct and indirect causal effects. Uh, I'll give you an example in a minute, but it's basically um, saying if there is a direct, say direct relationship between women and wage, and um, is there a, med a, ma a mediating mechanism that affects uh, wage from women. Good. So what we're trying to identify here is the total causal effects, not direct effects or indirect effects. So in the mediation analysis, which will be covered um, in the last week of our uh, course, covers a little bit about how to identify direct effects or indirect effects. But for now, we are just interested in identifying total causal effects only. Okay. Total causal effects, what, um, so in a simplest way possible, uh, uh, total effects is, uh, or causal effects is basically you are going uh, along with the flow of arrows, right? You're not reversing the, the, um, the direction of the arrows in the path. Good. That's, that's the uh, simplest way possible to think about um, causal effects. 
in non-consoled friends, which is basically um, basically not uh, every every path that is not causal. Any questions so far? I think it's a pretty brief review of the lecture. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to delete all of the uh, non-causal effects and identify these causal effects. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay. And before moving on to uh, more uh, complex models, path models. Let's talk about um, three sources of association. The first one is causation with mediation. Okay. So, uh, Variable A affects C, and C affects B. So C is a mediator between A and B, meaning it's an important mechanism that A becomes uh, influential in uh, determining the outcome B. Good. So it is noted as A is marginally associated okay. but um, they are independent when variable C is conditioned. Okay. What does that mean though? Right. So, okay. So if we control C, mm -hmm. then A is not actually is not associated. Yeah. They did with good. A. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So before, before control for C, A and B are not independent or they are associated. So that's why it's called marginal association. Marginal here means unconditioned. Okay? It's not conditioned at, at all. But uh, A and B are independent when C is controlled for. Or C is fixed to a certain number, right? Does that make sense? So C is fixed to a certain number, right? So it's not a variable anymore. Okay. So this association only happens when C changes a bit to a certain level, and B is change it, uh, B changes according, right? That's how association works, right? But then C is fixed to a number, right? So it's not a variable anymore in this situation. So there is no association here. No association here. Good. Any questions so far? Nope. So I'll give you uh, examples. We'll talk about examples. So. 
So let's say we have we thought of this stack. What do we mean by that? <coughs> right? So it means that women are more likely to be in quote unquote women's job or the jobs uh, that are occupied by predominantly occupied by women. And then the being in this job per se affects wages, someone's wages. So what does it mean by that? Um, so what kind of uh, experiences or how, uh, what kind of social mechanisms that it's trying to explain? So if you're a qualitative researcher, for example, there's qualitative researchers in, in this room, right? And what kind of people are you going are you going to look at to investigate this hypothesis? So there is another path that is direct path, right? Women's direct path on wages. Being a woman directly affects wages. What does it mean by? If you're like, oh, actually, I don't. Um, what kind of so, people so the, are you going to interview when you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Women, right? Women and <laughs> men in the same job. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's how you can think about this direct path. Okay. That's how you de design your research based around this path model. Then what does it mean by that? What does it mean by this indirect path? Men in predominantly female jobs also suffer from wage loss. Does that make sense? So there's actually research about that, um, uh, about devaluation of women's age, uh, primarily because Precisely because women are predominantly uh, represented in this specific occupation or job, they suffer uh, wage loss. And then there's, there is a, a serious concern for wage gaps, uh, gender wage gaps. For example, biologists uh, are supposed to be really ha enjoying high wages, but then their uh, wages just, uh, just became stagnant for whatever reason. And then a lot of researchers point that out pointed that uh, women's uh, representation led to uh, devaluation of women's jobs and hence they are they have uh, they are experiencing some stagnant wages. Okay. Uh, it depends on the measurement, but um, in this case it's more of a job hierarchy and job uh, occupation, all of that. So uh, there is research, also research about um, decomposing gender wage gaps, and um, um, this direct path where uh, the gender wage gaps within the same job positions have constituted explains five percent of gen, um, uh, create five percent differences between um, genders in terms of wages actually, um, and this indirect path explains um, about 30% of gender wage gaps actually. So the total effect of gender on wages is 35%, right? <laughs> but the direct effect is 5%. So if you read some Articles that uh, gender wage gaps has is just five percent after co controlling for some job characteristics. Then you should be able to think about what it's trying to say. Are they just looking at direct effect, or are we supposed to look at the total causal effect? Right. It depends on the theoretical question, but. Um, I would argue that total causal effects is more uh, important in that uh, investigation. Right? 
Does that make sense? Any questions so far? <coughs> nope. All right. Um, and yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, before uh, giving you another example, I forgot to. Oh, from this example, I, I can explain that. Um, so let's say we control for women's job, right? Then women's effect, uh, gender's effect on wages is only 5%, right? Then uh, the total causal effect is uh, not identified because of this control. The total causal effect is 35%, right? But by uh, controlling this variable, it looks like the estimation results make it seem like the uh, causal effects from women and wage is 5%. So this is called over-controlling bias. Okay. So, the raw wage gender wage gaps is the one we're look, trying to look at when we try to identify total causal effects. And controlling for this women's job characteristics is at least to over controlling bias. Does that make sense? A what? So, so in this situation, this is the uh, the DAG we're trying to postulate. We po this is the assumption, right? So, if in this DAG, if we control for a women's job, then that becomes over controlled bias because we cannot identify total causal effects anymore. So that's why you should not control for this variable for total causal effects. Does that make sense? So try to think about what we're trying to achieve and then what kind of assumptions are we trying, um, are we basing our inference on? Good? Yeah. And um, more similarly, um, there's uh, criminology in the literature about race gaps in terms of arrest rates and stuff like that. Um, predominantly black neighborhood. So, um, so basically black people are more likely to be in uh, living in uh, black neighborhood, and then that leads to uh, higher arrest rates. Right? And then this means, this uh, that means that um, white people in black neighborhood experiences higher arrest rates as well. And black people in white neighborhood experiences lower price rates in according to this DAG. Okay. So if you uh, so basically if you try to graph out institutional racism, then that would be uh, this DAG because um, Black people are like more likely to, to be in black neighborhood, and that per se leads to uh, police officers sort of quote unquote attention or something like that, and that leads to higher attention uh, arrest rates. Right? Does that make sense? And that is um, 
basically how you can um, uh, model or, or graph out institutional racism as opposed to individual racism that is represented by this direct effect. Does that make sense? So it's, it shows a two different ways of racism that play right here in this stack. So if you want to design your research around this DAG, and then you should think about how to um, how to um, implicate uh, the theories, like how to, uh, to, uh, to listen to uh, certain theories, implications, and then how to wrap out these um, the theoretical arguments into uh, the relationships along here. That's how you can use actually use that in your research. Even if you're not a quantitative researcher, I think it's a really good way to think about um, your research in general uh, because it really guides you how what people to talk to and then what kind of cases are you trying to look at to triangulate this this different arguments or different different sources of information to make it make it argument. Yeah. So from the black to black neighborhood to arrest rates, that's uh -huh. the institutional? Uh, In a way, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so black neighborhood mm -hmm. is like, oh, we have, like, this is a racist, based on the racist, you know, stigma, but then pre pre precisely because this is black neighborhood, there is, like, a lot of crimes going on, like, that kind of stigma affects, like, um, police officers, hideouts, and stuff like that, and then that affects, like, arrest rates and stuff like that. And the direct path is the... Individual oh, racism. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good. I have many comments about this kind of <laughs> situation, but I'll just... Yeah, I'm happy to discuss that after section, but... Um, yeah. And the third uh, exam, uh, example would be uh, Simpson's paradox. Yeah. Um, so in the, the um, I think it was in the seventies or something like that, but um. In UC Berkeley, there is a par there was a paradox. Um, men and women have total. This is the number of applicants, and then the admission rate was forty four for men, and admission rate was thirty five percent for women. But then, for every department, pretty much every department. Not every, but let's say every. Women's admission rate was higher within every department. Stop like that. Which is confusing, right? Within every department, women have higher chances of admission. But then, in ag in the aggregate sample, men had higher chances of admission. Why is that? This is actually um, it's this can be explained by um, causal questions. Um, so. Gender, admission rate, and there was a third factor, which is department selectivity. It was, so for example, women have 
uh, women have applied for highly competitive uh, departments such as English departments, which is hard to get into. If, if, whereas men applied more uh, easier to get into departments such as engineering because they have more spots. Good. And women within every department had a higher admission rate, but the department selectivity by nature affects the admission rates lower. Right? So, within every department, which is controlling for department selectivity, right? You're, um, within every department, you're basically controlling department by stratification strategy, right? And if you control for it, women are higher, women have higher chances of admission. But then, um, if you don't control for it, if you don't control for department selectivity, which means you're looking at the aggregate sample, then women have lower chances just because of this pattern. Does that make sense? Women have higher, women have applied to English departments and then they have experienced lower, but they, ha they all happen to be more selective. So that's why their just uh, admission rates has been lower in the aggregate sample. But then within every department, women have had higher chances. Interesting, right? Weird and interesting, right? This one, this one is the admission rates for women. This is 35%. So this part is the number of applicants. Oh, there's other departments. Number of applicants, and then this is the admission rates. Yep. Is this kind of yeah, yeah, I'll explain that in the mediation analysis, but yes, yes. But um, I would have to note that Sim uh, Simpson's paradox is not necessarily an example of causation. So it can be associated with uh, uh, confounding or, or uh, colliders as well. So Simpson's paradox in general is basically the, um, the coefficient of gender and admission rates, for example, changes depending on whether you um, look at the subgroups or not. So that's the nature of the Simpson's paradox, but it's not necessarily an example of causation. It can be related to other uh, uh, situations, sources of association. Am I making any sense so far or? Good? Yeah, all right, awesome. The second source is confounding, where this is defined marginal association. And, oops. Conditional independence. Okay. 
So uh, this is marginal. Uh, this is marginal association because without controlling anything, A and B are associated with each other. But um, if you control for C, then B and A and B are not related to each other anymore. I'll give you an example with the uh, this one. Um, let's say we are looking at the relationship between education and wage. In this relationship, in this DAG, is uh, postulating that um, for the sake of clarity, we just divide um, two groups, um, the sample into higher education group and lower education group. Okay. And higher wage group and lower wage group. Intelligence affects education and wage at the same time, meaning that um, education per se does not really lead to higher wages, but then um, people with higher intelligence have tend to have a higher education and they also earn higher uh, wages. So that's the confounding situation right here. That, that's the, what the dad suggests, right? It means that intelligent people, which is noted as uh, this colored marks are more likely to be in higher education uh, system or high, higher education, uh, have high, higher education level. And on the other hand, for lower education is the opposite. And for higher education, uh, higher wage, the situation is similar. In the sense that intelligent people earn higher wages. Oh, sorry. I should have changed that. Uh, intelligent people are underrepresented in lower or education or lower wage level. Okay. So it seems like education and wages are correlated with each other because higher wages, uh, higher education people are precisely because it is pre uh, overrepresented by intelligent people and they have inter intelligent people. So they are correlated with each other, right? The pattern correlated with each other. Does that make sense? The, these variables are correlated with each other in the sense of the, the consistency of the patterns. Good. But then if you just, if you control for intelligence or just look at intelligent people, five to five, two to two, then there is no patterns, right? Higher education does not in increase the chance of higher wages. Does that make sense? Good. Any questions so far? So that's what, um, if you don't uh, control for intelligence, then you would be subject to confound, confounding bias. <coughs> so in this case, you should 
control board intelligence. So, in the regression model, it does not tell you whether intelligence is a confounder or a mediator at all. Because if you switch the arrows to here, if you the, the direction of the arrow to here, then um, even the regression results don't since regression results don't have any directions at all, the regression results will be exactly the same, right? But then um, how you perceive this as a bias or this is a correct controlling, that depends on the theoretical um, postulation that you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I making any sense to you? Like, yeah. Oh, I sorry. I mean, how do we know there's a confounding bias? Is it because uh -huh. the pattern is between these two circles? Yeah, so, so um, without looking at the pattern, right? Uh, without looking at this differentiation, so um, um, uh, they are. They, they are they are correlated with each other in the sense of uh, they are similar people. There's uh, these people are in this case. Higher education people are also in higher wages, and lower education people are lower wages. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, if you control for it, then there is no patterns. Five to two, exactly five to two. Is that, yeah? I have questions. Uh -huh. um, I think the relationship between education and intelligence uh, could be, yeah. I think maybe if, if we are intelligent, we will receive more education, or maybe um, education made us more intelligent. Yeah, so but um, if we, yeah. yeah, if we control intelligence, mm -hmm. we may avoid the uh, compounding bias that um, you see the causation mm -hmm. of of such a such a graph and not be an open pass. What? Sorry. So I mean, if if there's uh, there are two arrows, two different which have different... This one? Yeah. No, this is not how DAGs work. Okay. This is... um. So, to model this uh, relationship, you need time variables. So, intelligence, time one. Uh, education, time two. Intelligence, time three, and stuff like that. So, you need time dimensions to model this way. So, but uh, we're not looking at time dimensions at this point. So, um, so we can't answer the question for now. So DAX is called uh, directed acyclic graphs for a reason, because it does not allow this usually reinforcing relationship without, uh, without the uh, introduction of time dimension. Okay. All right. Oh, before we move on, um, we move on. I'll I can give you a couple more example or just one. Um, but um, so actually, I just read um an ASR uh paper. Uh, ASR means like a journal name, basically. <laughs> uh, uh, so like, what's a journal? What's a journal? You should say. Uh, American Sociological 
or review. review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is basically the, the top journal. You right. published in it already? Oh, what? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. Um, I, I, I haven't published it, but <laughs> the first one, but um, I read it. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, uh, so there was a, there was a paper um, in ASR about uh, there's treatment and there's alcohol. And for the sake of simplicity, I won't explain what, what these are. But then um, they basically boast there are 33 confounding variables, confoundings found according to their postulation. And they included them in the analysis, right? But uh, the reasoning is that confoundings were equate, equated as um, other possible explanations of why. This is not exactly true. Because confounders should be affecting the treatment as well. So the point here I'm trying to uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that you should be focusing on the treatment's effect on why while not trying to explain every possible other explanations out there uh, in the social phenomena of interest. Yeah, yeah. So um so we are not interested in explaining every possible variation of why out there. We're trying to identify this causal path. So including 33 confoundings and stuff like that is not really, it's not exactly impressive, I would say, because of that, because their reasoning should include how controlling, controlling variables are possibly affecting the treatment as well. But then they just included this confoundings based on the logic that this is, might be the other, other possible explanations of why. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in brown bags and uh, their like, um, presentations and whatnot, like academic presentation settings, people casually make comments about you should include include these control variables because it might affect why. Um, that is not what I would do because you should uh, include the reasoning why the controlling variables are treatment as well. Okay, so every time I hear this kind of comment, I get to, <laughs> yeah, all of, yeah, it's, yeah. I would need more explanation, explanation. That, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be condescending or anything, but um, <laughs> but um, it's it's not, yeah, it's not what I would do. That's what I'm saying. Is there any specific terms for indicating the situation? Like what we see? Uh huh. Like other possible explanation? Oh, just just this situation? Just see, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one is just like other affect other factors that might affect why. That is not like. <laughs> there is no like no, term no. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is three sources of association, and that's yeah, uh, con uh, uh, causation, confounding, and collider, which I'll explain in a minute. Before oh, uh, before covering um, collider, I'll explain um, another example. Another example with the Simpsons paradox as well. As I said, Simpsons paradox is not necessarily associated with particular uh, sorts of association. Yeah. So in Simpsons paradox, this is actually from my research. Um, so for our research. So um, 
So we basically surveyed the city of Madison employees about their leave experiences. And then um, this is parental leave link. And then, um, so we so we basically, um, women are less likely to be in the fire department and women are more likely to use uh, longer leave, basically. And what we found is in the aggregate sample, Fire department, men, women, has these coefficients, which means that um, compared to other employees in the city government, fire department employees had uh, 4.2 days shorter, uh, used, uh, used 4.2 used 4.2 shorter, basically, on average. But then, if you, uh, you know, specify the sample only to men or women, then the coefficients become 2.1, negative 2.1, or 2, negative 2.7, okay. which is weird, right? Um, so I haven't thought about that too much, but the reviewer, said this is weird there is something gotta be like there is something statistically wrong or in the table in the report of the reserve results there's there's gotta be a mistake or something like that but um if you think about it it's a variant of simpson's paradox right in the sense that in the aggregate sample um this is actually slightly negative um, without controlling for women, fire department's leave length uh, relationship is more strongly negative because this confounder. Does that make sense? But now that we um, stratify our sample by gender, it's now controlled, right? So this is 2.1 to 2.7, think of 2.2, because this one. Okay. But without controlling women, the coefficients has been strong, more negatively strong because of this confounder relationship. Does that make sense? So this is actually what happened in our research, and then um, as a response, I um, made a graph to really represent what's going on and stuff like that. But um, my point here is that um, this variant, at least a variant of census paradox, can be really happening in your research as well. Okay. Oh, this is all like postulated, but um, women are less likely to be the fire department, which is uh, empirically consistent with our data. And then um, women are generally more likely to use longer leave, um, actually, which is also confirmed by our data. Um, and then fire departments are, uh, employees are generally less likely to use longer leave um, uh, because they have, I mean, they're for some reason, basically. And then combined all of that, then you have this uh, table. Combining all of that information, then you would have, have this table. What, sorry. This one, this one is for men, uh, for male employees only, uh, non-fired employees or fire department employees are uh, generally has have, have used 2.1 less days. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, we, we have a lot of things to cover, but um, I'll just keep going fast and. Uh,
So it happens. The third one is collider. So this is characterized as marginal independence but conditional association as well. Okay. So before conditioning on C, there was no relationship between A and B. But then, as soon as you control for C, there is a relationship. Okay. This bias is called in endogenous selection bias. This is different from selection bias we talked about in the first week. Okay. This is specific kind of selection bias are we talking about because of the collider. Does that make sense? Selection bias is like Catholic school versus public school. You remember that example, right? But in this case, it's a specific kind of situation. It's slightly different. It's, it's different. I'll give you an example um, of that. This is New Jersey. I'll just, New Jersey. Uh, income maintenance. Experiments. So, so um, we basically, um, basically, so they, these people, experimental winners, basically, um, from my understanding, provided free education and see what happens with the income level after the education and see if education actually helps in increasing uh, someone's income. Okay. But then they only uh, uh, this is sample. So this is sample was selected For those who earn uh, five thousand dollars, earn less than five thousand dollars a year as a household. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. But the problem was that. It was supposed to be plus. I mean, the relationship is supposed to be, I mean, is hypothesized to be plus, right? But then the actual estimation results were negative. Those who got education actually earned less on average. That was because there was an error term. That uh, probably represents how uh, much you care about money. Okay. And then that made a negative relationship. So as a result, this uh, the estimation result was negative.
Does that make sense? Why collider happened in this case? Uh, why you collider? Yeah. So this was sample selection. So you because, did something yeah. So basically, it uh, the program was uh, applied to only low earners. So they didn't do the experiment on high earners as well. Does that make sense? So you mean you condition on that? Two condition on that one. Yeah. And for collider issues, uh, others matters. I mean, um, if others coming from um, both A and B to C. Yeah. So only this one. Only this one. Yeah. Because I'll explain that uh, with the example. Because even though they are not really in really related to each other. Um, now that you specify that people are um, low earners, then the distribution, um, how much you care about money, will be distributed like this. Before selecting on the uh, sample, there's no relationship whatsoever between the two variables. But now that you have low earner sample selected, then you can expect, oh, this person is either um, higher educated, but not that interested in um, earning so much money, or they care about money, but then not really educated, or both. But in this case, higher educated and you care about money, then it's really hard to see the observations where you earn lower money. Even though you can, you have higher education, you, you care about money. Does that make sense? So as a result, you have negative association. Even though before selecting on the outcome variable, there was no relationship whatsoever within the, between the two variables. Does that make sense? No? I'll give you another example then. Yeah. Um, yeah, another example. Let's talk about a tenure example. That were that was discussed in the lecture. Originality and creativity. Let's say there's no relationship between the two variables, okay? But then, so before selecting on that, originality and creativity were not related to each other. But now that you specify your sample to tenured professors only, then you would have either had originality or creativity. Or both. If you don't have any of them, then it's really less likely to get tenure, right? And as a result, you have negative association. Good. And if you might have noticed, this spurious association is the, uh, the the exact the sign of the association is exact opposite of the product of these two paths coefficients. Does that make sense? Why is that? Try to make sense. If you're trying to make sense of it, it's more like a I don't I don't major in electronic 
engineering, but um, if you think about it, it's a, it's a circuit, right? In the sense that if you have no blockage, the, uh, the electricity just flows, but then if you block this uh, side, but then the association cre cre is created to compensate for this blocked, blocked uh, association. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? This is plus, right? This is a direct, this is plus. And then try to compensate for it through our, the spirit's relationship becomes negative. Any questions so far? Yeah, after controlling C, so you don't want to control for C. You don't control for C in this situation because that leads to endogenous selection bias. So you should let the flow, uh, let the electric flow. Yeah, because precisely because it should. It should be the case, right? Inherently, like that's how society works, or that's how you, we postulate the society works, right? But um, the issue here is trying to get uh, what we want without having any biases, right? That's the identification issue we're talking about, right? But then, if you control for it, then we have unwanted biases and therefore we don't have causal um, um, we don't have uh, total causal effects identified so that's what we're concerned about here okay no so so no um so so this is not so so let's say we have we are interested in um, the relationship between A and C, okay? But if we control for C, then we have unwanted spurious associations. We're not interested in the relationship between A and B in this case. So, but then um, you could be interested, right? But even so, even so, Let's say we are trying to identify A to B, right? But still, if you control for C, then you have this negative or spurious association <coughs> that might not be, that is not helpful to identify this relationship because this path coefficient is A, for example, then you have this spurious correl correlation such as E. So you cannot get A ever while controlling for C. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions? How the spurious association uh -huh. affects our target association A to, B, A to C? Oh, you, even if you're looking at A, A and B, what you want to get is A, right? But the estimation results would be A minus C, right? I mean, I don't know, I, A to C. If our goal is estimate A to C, mm -hmm. then um, you don't control for C and just run the regression of C on A and without A. selecting on any outcomes or something like that. Okay, so C is our true estimation. And after uh -huh. controlling C, and there should be like, E. But you're not controlling for C when you're ru running the regression of C on A, just without any control. So, so what, what, if, what, if, what, if, if, what if I control C? Don't do it. That's the point. I don't right? know. In this case, like, <laughs> I just tried to list like a mechanism how uh -huh. association uh -huh. is made by this our true association. 
그죠? 아하. Uh -huh. So if I complete for C, uh -huh. there should be unexpected uh -huh. or spurious association uh -huh. between A and B, uh -huh. then E, uh -huh. and how we affect our C. Oh. So then um, what you can do here is control for B as well. So that way, this path is not affecting uh, this path, um, the estimation results. Does that make sense? Is that what you're asking? So the, our previous example in the uh -huh. energy uh -huh. on the bottom. Uh -huh. So our true, true association between P and Y uh -huh. is plus. Mm -hmm. But you say, if we have, if we control for Y, mm -hmm. condition on Y, mm -hmm. the true effect from T to Y, mm -hmm. which is plus, mm -hmm. became minus. Right. So I'm just wondering why plus become minus. So this is minus, uh, this is plus, and then this is yeah. minus plus. For this path, uh -huh. okay. this is negative. So the magnitude is bigger than... Yeah, the, man, you, yeah the magnitude happened to be bigger than uh, this side, actually. That's why plus became minus. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I yeah. Thank you. Um, but then um, my point here is to is not to conduct sample selection. Okay. So um, if you selecting on outcome by um, selecting on the C by sample selection, it is called endogenous sample selection bias, which is a type of endogenous selection bias. Am I going too fast or? Nope. Right. No. And I'll give you another example, um, ex experiments. Let's say you are running the, this experiment. So the treatment of interest rate is T right here. And then you are looking at the relationship between P and Y. And um, X is an observed characteristic that happened to be balanced between the treatment group and the control group. So there is no relationship between the two, right? But then U2, which is a, uh, an observed variable, is not balanced to treatment, so that way you too can affect treatment. But it is, it is an observed variables, okay? But if you control for X in this case, you get a negative or spurious association between U1 and U2. What does that make? T, U2, U1, and Y. There's a non-causal path. So there is a spurious relationship between treatment and the outcome. Okay? So, so oh. the observed association between T and Y mm -hmm. after controlling X mm -hmm. is combined our causal effect mm -hmm. plus spurious effect. Yes. Right, right? Yes. 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 Um, but if you don't control for it, then um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. Um, 
So uh, let's say you are running an experiment, okay? The treatment is right here, and the outcome is right here. X variable is happens to be balanced between the treatment group and the control group, so there is no association. But then, in the uh, unobserved characteristics, you have to be on unbalanced um, groups. Okay. If you control for X, then in the regression line, in the like regression of Y, T, and X to control for it, to control for X, even though it's not really related to T, and you get the spurious relationship right here, and uh, T, U2, U1, and Y, a non-causal path is obtained. So non-causal path. T and U2 is the reverse uh, direction based on the reverse direction. So that's why it's non-causal. You're saying T affects U2, right? But then it's not the case. It's the that's not what we're trying to get at. The causal effects are based on the paths that are only based on directional uh, arrows. Okay, anything that is not causal path is non-causal paths. So in any of the cases, you should not get um, this flow against the direction of the arrow that was considered. Non-causal path is uh, is not causal path. Causal path is basically uh, every path that has uh, direction of that flows along the direction of the arrows. Okay. If you don't have any of, like, if you don't have, uh, if you have any of the um, arrows like that, then you have the non direction, a uh, non causal path. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, it doesn't, but um, it the flow from P to Y, P to Y goes from from P to U2, U1, and Y. This is a non cosmic path. Mm -hmm. This one, yeah. this path per se is non-causal, yeah. but uh, I was gonna, I will mention that, but um, this is blocked. X is blocked, right? Or con so the condition conditioning means that it's blocked. Yeah, it's still open. Yeah, this is a non-causal path that is open. But this is a causal path that is closed. Does that make sense? So these are two different dimensions. This is, yeah, actually one of the most sources, primary sources of confusion. Um, so causal versus non-causal. And opening and closing are two different dimensions, okay? So you want to open all non-causal paths and close all not uh, close all non causal paths. Does that make sense? That's how you can get causal identification. Okay. Meaning that you have the causal effects you want. Yeah. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, so, um, take away here is that even though uh, you have uh, <coughs> um, this path, basically, so the point takeaway here is that you don't want to control for covariance in analyzing experimental results. You always want to regress Y on T and nothing else. While checking balance for observed variables. So you should you should check for balance based on our observed characteristics, but in the analysis, you should not include control variables, okay? I mean, if there are some unbalanced uh, characteristics, you happen to get some unbalanced characteristics by chance, you might consider for it, but um, you should be really careful about controlling for some covariance in the regression model. Regression model. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, before moving, so um, that's what we have pretty much covered um, from the lecture, but then um, the the second problem set has rights path rules, which will be covered tomorrow in the lecture. So I'll cover the gist of that. So um, you so you can um, solve the problem set too. Okay. So this is a little bit of preview in a way. So before um, moving on to rights path rules, I want to emphasize what. Uh, What's the meaning of uh, association and independence of calculus? So association is you can predict the variable of interest or the outcome based on certain variables or uh, t or x, whatever. So this is the association. You can predict, at least with some uh, uncertainty, you can predict what will be uh, the outcome level based on your treatment or covariance. Okay. It is uh, represented as open path. Open path. This is what association means. Okay. And independence is you cannot predict the variable of interest based on certain variables. For example, if you conditioned on x, then it's fixed to a number, right? And this is closed or independent, or Z and Y are independent to each other in the sense that Z cannot be helpful in understanding Y, in, um, in predicting the level of outcome. Because X is always fixed to a number, and then that dictates the outcome. Can you repeat what you just said about Z and Y? Yeah, so um, so basically Z and Y are independent of each other mm -hmm. in this path, or it is a closed path because based on Z, you cannot predict Z X because X is fixed to a number in this situation. And then this fixed to say, whatever that is, you are fixing it to a number. Okay, let's say three. And then three, like, 
three dictates Y's outcome. So there is no probabilistic association. It is just based on three, you're expecting the number of Y. Good. So that's why it's called independence or it is represented as closed pattern. Does it make sense? Am I making any sense? Uh, I can do that um, after section, if that's okay. Yeah. We have a lot of things to cover. Sorry about that. Um, so, there are three rules of association. Okay. Actually, there are, there's two. Uh, it can be summarized as two. Conditioning on a non-collider blocks the path, and vice versa. And not conditioning on a collider blocks the path. Vice versa. Okay. So, for example, um, it means that without knowing the value of low birth weight of a baby. You can't predict mother's smoking from mother's genetics. Okay? Does that make sense? That's what it means. But if once you know whether, uh, once you know a baby is falls into the category of low birth weight, there's a serious correlation between it uh, smoking and genetics, meaning that by looking at the smoking situation, you can predict genetics and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah. The pass here means smoking and genetics. A what? The pass means here uh -huh. is the pass between smoking and genetics. Mm -hmm. that, am I right? Oh, so there is an open path, yeah. So uh, condi conditioning on a collider opens a path. This path between smoking and genetics. Because there is association, right? Based on the smoking status, you can predict genetics and vice versa. Now that you conditioned on low birth weight. Before that, before that, it was a closed path because you cannot predict each other. Uh, what do you mean by closed or open path? Yeah, so uh, so that's uh, so open path is an association and closed path is an independence. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this one. IQ affects education and wage, right? Open path, this is an open path, good, because education, based on edu education, you can predict the IQ and IQ predict wages. Does that make sense? Of course, this is a non-causal path that is open. But if you control for it, 
you cannot predict IQ based on education anymore because it's fixed to a number. And uh, you cannot predict wage based on IQ because it's fixed to a number. So this is this becomes non-causal path that is closed. Now. So causal and non-causal path are uh, decided by the configuration of a DAG. And opening and closing are decided by condition on certain variables. Does that make sense? Yeah, so they, there are two different dimensions. And uh, causal identification Causal identification is um, so identification from T to Y is achieved when you adjust Z such that Z closes all non causal path. Between um, P and Y and P and Y, which means no spuriousness going on, and Z opens all causal paths between um, P and Y. Adjust means uh, control for or conditioning. Uh, Z closes such that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, Um, seems like we cannot cover rights path rules, but um, I'll try to figure out how to cover this part. But um, uh, we're just for the remaining time, let's focus on one example of causal identification. Where So here's an example. The question is whether the effect of T on Y is identifiable. How can you make it um, <coughs> identify the causal effect from T on Y, T to Y? So first of all, you should not close any of the causal path. What is the causal path here? T to C to Y, right? So you don't want to block C right here, okay? And what is the non-causal path? T to X, C, Y, T, X, Y, T, X, U, Y. All of the causal path can be blocked by conditioning on X. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, TCY is a causal path, right? And from T, TCXY. Here's a non-causal path. Uh, T X C Y is a non-causal path, right? T X Y 
is a non-causal path. P x u y is a non-causal path. Does that make sense? So all of the non-causal path has a common factor, which is x. So if you control for x, then you have all the all the non-causal path blocked. Does that make sense? So um, the causal identification is basically about opening all the causal path and blocking all the non-causal path. Okay. So that way. So why is it blocked after controlling? Hmm. So if you control for x, then it's fixed to a number, right? Then you cannot see the association between t and x because it's a number. You know the what is the association, right? What is what is an association? Right, yeah. But then in this case, t goes up, then x is fixed to a number. So there's no association. There's an independence, right? So we can call it blocked because we cannot expect tx based on t, and then it affects, then it is, you can expect y based off of t, right? Because it's a number. Good? Yeah, awesome. How about x on y? Can you identify the causal effect? Oh, wait. Nope. All right. Yeah. No. The answer is no. Why is that? So there is a non causal path x, u, y, for example. But then you can control for u because it's not observed. You cannot control for unobserved characteristics, right? So that way, t on y is not identifiable. All right. Um, any questions? It's identifiable by by controlling for x. x. Yes. Yeah. So, if you block for not all the non-causal path, which means no sphere relationship whatsoever, mm -hmm. and then you have all the causal path, then you have identified the causal effect. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, as as I was saying. Uh, causal identification is achieved by opening all the causal path and blocking all the non-causal paths. Good. Any questions? Did I rush too much? Sorry about that. I feel, all right. Yeah. Um, so, so I think Felix or. Professor Elward will cover. Uh, <laughs> I should, yeah, I should differentiate. Uh, I don't know. But um, yeah, Professor Elward will cover rice path rules. And uh, I think that will be helpful. But um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'm not sure if I will have more time to cover rice path rules in the next section, but um, I'll think more about that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, 
thank you so much, and see you tomorrow in lecture. Here's that uh, document, and then that's my okay. problem set. Thanks. Yeah, sure. I actually.